Good morning, members. I'd like to call the uh, Environmental Resources Policy and Finance Committee to order. Today's date is Tuesday, February 7th. Uh, first order of business, uh, members, is um, the minutes. Uh, the minutes are before us. Representative Eklund, would you move the minutes, please? Mr. Chair, I move the minutes from last meeting, February yep, 7th. February 7th. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Um, any additions or corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Minutes are approved. Thank you, members. Uh, next, we have um, a technical uh, fix that we have to do on House File uh, 586, which was the uh, uh, Representative Draskowski's bill that was before us on Tuesday. Uh, we inadvertently uh, sent that to a tax committee, and we need to send it to Legacy. So um, I'd like to uh, move to reconsider uh, the re-referral of House File 586 to the Committee on Taxes for the purpose of uh, instead of referring the bill to Legacy. Okay, so Representative Hanson and I, we texted on this yesterday a little bit. So here's discussion time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and we're inclined to support the, the motion. I just wanted to see, did Legacy request it or was it a... Oh. No, it was just... It was an administrative it's mistake that happens seldom, if ever. <laughs> okay. Amy hadn't had and the, we, co we hadn't the coffee yet. And we accept responsibility for that. So we, um, we like that personal responsibility, just like you guys do. So yes. we would support the we would support the motion. Thank you. So, members, any further discussion on the uh, motion to reconsider the re-referral of House File 586? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Uh, the motion is uh, passed. Now, members, the bill is before the committee again. And so what I would like to do is uh, move that House File 585, as amended, uh, be recommended to referral to the Legacy Funding Finance Committee. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you, members. Um, now we have before us um, House File 434. And uh, I'd like to move that House File 434 be recommended to be re referred to Ways and Means Committee. Um, so um, this, is the, uh, this is the wetland replacement bill. We do have some people here to, uh, to testify on behalf of the bill. We've put a lot of work into this uh, trying to, we've recognized the uh, fact that uh, the Wetland Replacement Bank is uh, in need of some infusion of cash uh, to get the uh, construction season started this year. And some people who are a lot smarter than I am can, can go into the details of this. But uh, this is an important thing. <clears throat> I know that uh, we're all pretty committed to getting this done so that uh, county road projects and so forth can proceed uh, across the state of Minnesota uh, this spring. Mm -hmm. When the frost leaves the ground, which I'm not sure when that's going to be in Roseau County, it was 33 degrees below zero up there the night before last. So, plus the wind chill. So, yep. So then, in order to get the bill in the shape that uh, I would like, um, I've got the DE2 amendment in your packet. So I would like to uh, move uh, the DE2 amendment. Uh, all those in favor of that, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. So now we have the bill in the order in which I would like. Um, we have some people here to uh, testify on the importance of the bill. So with that, um, would you please identify yourselves for the records and proceed with the uh, explanation of the bill and your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. Good morning. Angie becker Cadelco, Assistant Director with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. And I'm Dave Wires, uh, also Assistant Director with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Mr. Chair, members, we're here today to provide an overview of the program and the current status that it sits. We all know the functions that wetlands provide. They slow down water by acting as a sponge. They filter contaminants, and they let pollutants settle out. The Wetlands Conservation Act, enacted in 1991, adopted the state policy of no net loss for wetlands due to the amount of wetlands that were lost across the state. 
The local roads replacement program was created in statute in 1996. The program requires that the state of Minnesota through Bowser is responsible for replacing wetlands lost to certain local government authority road functions. So for example, if a local road authority like a county or a township wants to widen a road and widening that road impacts the wetland, they report that to the state and then the state is responsible for mitigating that wetland. It's worked really well for 20 years. The local government road authorities are, um, are offered something that is more efficient permitting for them. It's a more streamlined process. And for the state, it offers higher quality functioning wetlands. Instead of replacing wetlands you know, right, in the, right in the road where it's been disturbed, the road right away is where they've been disturbed, it allows the state to create larger wetlands, grouping them together, creating better functioning ecologically. Uh, Mr. Chair and, 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 and members of the committee, what this slide shows you is the recent uh, funding history of the local road program, and this is uh, really uh, what's precipitated the legislation that's before you today, is the fact that going back at least to 2010, the amount of funding that's been provided uh, through legislative appropriations that have been typically bond funds uh, have been less than half of what the request has been. Uh, this has resulted in, in the reduced generation of wetland credits. Uh, so it's gotten to the point now where we do not have adequate credits to comply with the statutory requirement to provide the mitigation for eligible local road projects. The, oops, oh. the program is, 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 is managed on the basis of bank service areas, as we call them. They are essentially uh, 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 basin areas uh, across the state. Uh, these areas are recognized for managing wetland replacement both under the Wetland Conservation Act as well as under the uh, Clean Water Act Section 404 program. It's important to understand the geography in, 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 in which we management because one of the key ways that we've been trying to, to stay compliant with our requirement to provide the mitigation is we've, we've taken credits from one bank service area to provide mitigation for impacts in another bank service area. Now the reason why, that is, why, that, why that's important is that once you cross those boundaries, you are placing at, at, at a higher ratio. We are, we, we, we are burning through the credits at, at a higher rate and we're in fact doing that. Uh, via a, uh, a board action this past October, uh, the Bowser Board adopted a management plan where we are no longer doing that due to the fact that the credits have gotten so low that it's no longer seen prudent to continue that practice. So via, a, again, a, a board adopted plan, uh, we are now managing the credits only on a bank service area by bank service area base. We are not crossing boundaries in, in, in any further due to that increased burn rate of our increasingly short supply of wetland credits. And in fact, uh, starting, uh, we are in the process of, of closing wetland bank service areas to replacement for local road projects. And in fact, the, the, uh, this past December 2nd, uh, we were out of credits in bank service area four, which is the Lower Red River. Um, as we call them in our, in, in our system as of December 2nd. Uh, that also coincided with Bank Service Area 6, which is the St. Croix River. Those were both closed, effective December 2nd. And then we also provided notice in January for effective February 2nd that Bank Service Area 9, which is the Minnesota River, also we're out of credits there. Um, and and, and uh, we, we have closed them. Um, and actually what you see here in front of you is that this actually is a soon to be out of date map because we are in the process of providing notice that Bank Service Area 7, the central Mississippi area is also going to be closed. Uh, we'll be publishing a notice in the state register on Monday to provide a 30 day notice of the closure. So effective March 15th, we also will no longer be providing what the mitigation for Bank Service Area 7 as well as we are out of credits uh, in that area as well too. So it's becoming a bit of a uh, snowball effect as, as this thing goes forward, making the, it, it, it really uh, very critical that additional funding be provided. So, Mr. Warren, excuse me for interrupting. Um, we have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. And just for the knowledge, especially some of our newer people, when you talk about uh, wetland credits, <laughs> what is the unit that goes along with that? Um, Mr. Chair, the wetland credit unit it, it, uh, is based upon both. Um, uh, land measurement in terms of, of, of an acre, but it's also the amount of restoration that in fact occurs. Certain actions will generate a, a higher amount of wetland credit. So if you're, an example being, if, if it's a completely drained wetland that's being restored, that will often get 100% credit. So that will get you, you know, one acre of restored 
fully drained wetland will get you one acre of credit. But it, but if you're all you're doing is restoring part of the benefits, you get a lower share of uh, of, of of the wetland credit. So it's it's a combination of land area as well as the amount of restoration that occurs on the site. Thank you. Uh, Representative Newberger, and then Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quick question uh, for the folks back home as we try to explain this. If you build a road and you uh, eliminate a portion of, of wetland, uh, so what you're talking about then is that you are going to restore or you're going to uh, recreate new wetland uh, in order to offset the, what, you're, what you're replacing here or what your, your construction. So my question is, if, uh, if you have a road project, let's say, in Cook County, uh, where does the restoration, it, could it be anywhere in the state or does it have to be in the district that, it, that the construction is located in or does it have to be in the county that the construction is located in? Where does the replacement land have to be? Director Wyrens. Um, there's, uh, Mr. Chairman, there, there are a couple ways to explain that in terms of the way the system in fact works. Um, the Wetland Conservation Act divides the state into three pre settled <laughs> wetland areas. That's the first thing to be aware of. There's a, there's a greater than 80%, think of the primarily northeast 40% of the state. There's 50 to 80%, that's a, that's a band in the center. And then there's a less than 50%, that's the, the western and southern parts of, of, of the state. The way the law works is that um, impacts in the less than 80% part of the state cannot be replaced in, in a greater than 80% part of the state. That's the first thing. However, the greater can't go anywhere in the state. So we're trying to acknowledge the fact there's a lot of wetlands still remaining in that northeast part of the state, and we try to acknowledge that with the way the, way the, the, the law is, in fact, structured. So if you are in, in, in Cook County, well, the other thing to be, be mindful of, too, is that that's the way the state law uh, operates. We also provide wetland replacement, what's required under the Clean Water Act Section 404 program as well by this. Uh, so by the wetland replacement, we're covering both state and federal wetland replacement requirements. And their rules on, on mitigation are not quite the same as ours. They, they, they're, they're very close, but not quite identical. Um, so we need to be mindful of that as well, too. The main issue up in Cook County, though, is what, we'd, what the way it would work is you would first always want to look within that uh, as close as possible. If there's mitigation in the county, we try and do that in the watershed. Um, but as a matter of law, it's required only in, in the bank service area. So that Lake Superior, that blue area you see in the map, is where we, we would first look. Uh, but from there, if we don't have credits, we then look at, at adjacent bank service areas until we can, in fact, find both the appropriate amount and wetland type to match the impact that's been reported to us. Cool. Representative Newberger. <laughs> Thank you for your detailed explanation. So the simple answer is, is that, yes, you could put it basically anywhere. You could take it from one spot and, and reclaim it technically anywhere else in the state, technically. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you're in yep. Cook County, that it would be te 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 technically correct. If you're other parts of the state, that would not be correct. Uh, and uh, Director Wyrens, when you talk about uh, the less than 80 percent, we're talking about 80 percent of what? Uh, that, that is a very good question, Mr. Chair. We're referring to, uh, in the law, a way of providing for a differing application of the regulations to acknowledge historical wetland loss that's occurred since statehood. Uh, it's, there was a study done back in the early 80s that, that looked at the amount of wetlands that, were, that, are, that, that are remaining at the time as it relates to the, the, the pre-settlement time. So it's a pre-settlement wetlands that are in existence, what we're referring to. And th th this, this now did affect, uh, it did demonstrate, again, in the western parts of the state <laughs> and in the southern, I mean, agriculture as a state, there's been a higher degree of wetland loss as compared to what historically would have been there. Um, and then as you go to the northeast, the amount of pre-settlement wetlands that are remaining uh, increases. Thank you. Representative Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you just define for me what, what you mean when you say the area is closed? Director Byron? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative, what it means is that if a, if a local road authority uh, comes in with a otherwise eligible project that we should provide mitigation for under the law, we will not be doing that. We, we, we will be communicating with that county, city, or township uh, that they would need to uh, go uh, look into the private marketplace because there is a private <laughs> wetland banking system that they could buy those credits from or they'd have to create their own wetlands for those impacts as well. Um, we are saying that we will not provide the wetland replacement um, uh, in those bank service areas because we do not have the credits to do so. Representative Clark. Thank you. And Director Irons, what's the cost difference between a private wetland bank and the state uh, wetland bank uh, per well, unit? 
Well, Mr. Chairman, the, the dollar value does vary uh, quite a bit across the state. The main determinant of the, the cost of wetland credits is, is land values, as you might imagine. Uh, but the, the, the cost of the fact range from, uh, we see uh, um, anywhere from uh, uh, 10 to 15,000 in, in the northern part of the state where land values tend to be lower uh, to 80,000 plus in the metro area is not uncommon as well. I mean, it's that kind of a range that exists across the state. And members, just one of the things um, uh, that I've talked about, uh, I have people in my area that, uh, you know, one instance, for example, a person purchases a small piece of property, say 40 acres, and uh, the land there is worth uh, 800 bucks an acre or something like that, and then they have an easement to gain access to the land, and they start doing some work uh, with the track hoe and going to build a driveway, and the next thing you know, they're buying wetland credits. Uh, that cost them fifteen, eighteen thousand uh, dollars an acre. And one of the things that I've tried to have discussions with about people is how do we reduce the cost of some of these and get them more proportional to the actual uh, value of the land? Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Um, you, you talked about local unit of governments be able to create their own wetland banks. What's the approximate amount of time for them to create <coughs> a wetland bank in? Uh, reference to this uh, upcoming com uh, construction season. Director Wirens. The timeline to generate uh, or to um, <coughs> do restoration, you know, to generate wetland credits, uh, it can be a lengthy period of time. If you're going into the wetland banking process <coughs> where you're creating a typically a large area that you're restoring to generate wetland credits that you can reserve for future needs or to sell as the case might be, you know, that kind of process uh, to actually get the, the site selected to get the approvals both at the from the local government who, under the Wetland Conservation Act as well as through the Army Corps of Engineers. That process can take uh, in excess of a year to a year and a half to get all those approvals. Uh, and then they have to actually do the restoration work and at, once they've certified they've done the restoration, in most cases they can get an initial deposit of wetland credits. Uh, the amount is typically 15% of the total area that they can receive. You know, a typical timeline is, is anywhere between, you know, on a very simple project, it can be done within actually a year, um, but, uh, but, any, but anywhere from, from a year to, to two to two and a half years before that first deposit is, uh, is sort of what that range looks like under that sort of a setting. Representative Eklund. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And in regards to that, when I was first on the county board in Cooch County, we started about six years ago on an 80 acre wetland bank. They still don't have the credits. <laughs> It's not complicated. <laughs> Representative Green, I see a smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, to either one of the testifiers, um, is there anything within the law uh, that, that would have stated or would have been put in there that said, there's going to reach a point when we don't need to do this anymore? And if we're in, if we're in areas where there's, we're, we're at 80% and there's, uh, and there's no place else to go. Uh, is is there anything that says this is enough? We've reached it. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, yep. uh, the the law states no net loss of wetlands, and so in following that, the the state is the the local roads program law states that the state is simply mandated to replace credits as they come into us. And that's Representative Green. Uh, in your opinion, as, as you've studied these, do you think that it would be a good idea to put into law that when we reach a certain point that, that there's really no, no uh, uh, advantage to taking more? <coughs> Director Kadelka. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Green, I think the uh, folks that are more technically sound than I would be able to answer the question better. And, and our job is really to implement the law as it stands and as it sits, and so that the law has been passed that says no net loss of wetlands, and then that's what we that's what we focus on, and we focus on that that historically Minnesota has lost between 50 to 90 percent in different parts of the state, and so that our job is to implement the law that says we are not to have any sort of net loss of those. Representative Green, and and then thank you, Mr. Chair, and then so another question then, if. Uh, if I, as a, as a local official, I'm, I'm doing my road mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I had to repair it and, I, and when I'm done, I put it back and I maybe have lost six inches uh, for, by widening the road, 
what does do I have to replace then that six inches or do I have to replace a whole impacted area? Director Kadelka or Director White. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and representing the way, way the law works, again, both under state and federal laws, is that in, in that case, you know, for the county, they would have to identify the amount of wetland that's been filled in that case. And, and report that as as a as a wetland loss, <coughs> and depending upon the amount of that, you know, under state law, we replace all the impact. We don't we don't we don't reduce any amount. Uh, there is the ability actually, um, if if the impact is small enough under under a general permit that the uh, St. Paul District of the Corps of Engineers uh, has on place, there's possible to actually you know not have to have mitigation required for very small amounts of impact, but the amount has to be has to be documented. Uh, for state purposes, uh, for sure, and again, paying upon the amount uh, for federal as well. Representative Green, and I understand that. And my question was getting to the point that we are expanding our wetlands greatly. We are uh, we are uh, requiring our road authorities to take very much needed transportation dollars to not only replace the impacted area, but to return the area to the way it was before we started. And so we're constantly struggling looking for transportation dollars for a crumbling road system. And I think that we really need to look at uh, maybe uh, the reclamation part of this could uh, uh, be used for the, the wetland banking. If you're putting it back the way that it was, then there's really no reason to go by sometime in some areas two for one. And this is going to have to stop somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to an earlier question on the, the, the credits themselves. As I was hearing that it takes a while to get these credits. Uh, seeing that there are a number of areas that are closed, once the money is available, how long is it going to take to build up these credits? How's, what's, what's the timeline on some of this? Because I know there's road projects waiting to get going. Mm -hmm. Director. Well, well, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the the part of the benefit of the legislation that the chair is proposing, if I buy some general fund dollars, we can use those to to buy existing wetland bank credits. There are, uh, you know, the the, the wetland bank system is a is a way to uh, for uh, landowners to drive additional income to restore wetland areas and to sell the wetland credits. You know, I indicated what the what the value of those. What the credits are, I mean, they are sold on a square foot basis is the way it, it works in, within the system. And we would use those funds to buy the wetland credits from existing private bankers to make sure that those road projects could go forward because they'd have the mitigation in hand at that point in time. Representative Fisher. Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, often we have the discussion about costs and don't talk about the benefits. And I th Thinking back, uh, you know, wetlands do have a value, uh, a benefit for the state. And I think we actually have court history on that going back to the early 60s or late 60s, maybe the 70s. I remember, it, I think the case was in Freeborn County, uh, a few miles from where I grew up, where a road was going to be put in and it had to be moved. And the, the case, the road had to be moved and the court found Prior to that, <clears throat> wetlands were referred to as swamp, swamp land or wasteland, no value, just something to be filled in, uh, something to get through or go over or to remove. But then that case said that they had a value that needed to be protected. There was a value, a benefit in a wetland being a wetland. And um, I, I think that's been kind of the foundation for over 50 years of where we've, where we've gone on that. And when we talk about uh, penalty or this is a, a difficulty uh, or it's a cost for the state or for a local government who represents people, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at the dollars and not the overall benefit. And there is an overall economic benefit as well to wetlands. Um, you know, this bill we talked about on, on the floor, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I think the governor had more money in it because we're having to mitigate the failure of last year having a, a no bonding bill. We're having to come back here and find some money, general fund, and I think the original bill before the DE2 had bonding. Could you maybe 
let us know what the the actual proposal was, what the need is from from the governor. Director, uh, Mr. Chair, members. So the governor's proposal has ten million dollars of bonding. That is what we we right now calculate as our biennial need is ten million dollars. But because we've had to close these bank service areas, there's a five point one million dollar general fund in addition to that as a catch up, and that will simply allow us, as as Assistant Director Wyron said, to buy some existing credits and start to reopen those bank service areas in the short term. Representative Hansen. Thank you. Proceed, please. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, actually that, that last question was the last slide in our presentation, so if there are any further <laughs> questions, we'd be uh, happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up to testify is uh, Kent Sulem and Keith Carlson. Would you come <laughs> down, please? And then after that, we've got uh, Fran Myron and Rick West and Don Arnosti. And then if there's anybody else who would wish to testify on the bill, make sure you let us know. Mr. Chairman, members, um, I'm Keith Carlson. Um, I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Intercounty <coughs> Association. Um, I'm here today to testify in support of House File 431. Um, I did want to start by indicating that this bill is uh, supported by our organization, uh, Minnesota Intercounty Association, that consists of 10 greater Minnesota regional center counties and four suburban counties here in the metro area. Uh, by the Minnesota Association of Townships that is represented by Mr. Sulem, by the League of Minnesota Cities, Minnesota County Engineers Association, and the Minnesota Rural Caucuses, Rural Counties Caucus. Um, I'm going to go through and give you some further background on what the local um, road wetland replacement program is, uh, and I will try and not be uh, redundant on what uh, was done here. Uh, really, this program was created in the context of the state's Wetlands Conservation Act, whose major tenet is no net loss in wetlands. Uh, integral to the policy of that is the two-for-one replacement ratio that exists in most of the state, the less than 80% of its pre-settlement uh, wetlands areas of the state, uh, and it does not apply to agricultural land, in which case the, re the replacement requirement is general one, one for one. Uh, has this indica been indicated by Bowser? Uh, we uh, abide by that policy either by constructing wetland replacement our wetlands ourselves or we purchase wetlands credits. Now, when the early days of the Wetlands Conservation Act, um, basically local governments frankly quite frankly revolted on to against the unfunded mandate inherent in the program uh, we all are road authorities that's one of the main services that we provide uh, and this has created a major cost for us uh, given uh, the wet significant wet areas in the state uh, to stem the objections in 1996 the legislature came up with the object of the, this bill, the Local Road Wetland Replacement Program. And its basic tenet was to excuse local road authorities, townships, cities, and counties from our obligations to replace the wetlands that were impacted by our construction projects on existing roads uh, when we were reconstructing them to meet current con safety and design standards. To the extent where we construct new roads or add lanes to existing roads, we still have to pay the entire time to have for that. Okay, Bowser already went through why we're here because of the underfunding that's occurred over several bienniums for this program. Um, has has also been indicated Bowser has been managing this underfunding in several ways. Uh, they have been borrowing credits from um, MnDOT uh, that <coughs> operates its own systems of wetlands banks. They can no longer do that and, in fact, have to pay that back. 
and also by trading credits across the geography that consists of these 10 uh, wetlands bank service areas. Uh, effective December 1st, Bowser said they would no longer do the latter policy. They would not trade credits across the bank service areas boundaries. And basically said, has the uh, credits were exhausted in each bank service area um, that um, they would no longer meet the requirements of state law to, to provide the replacements for the wetlands impacted by uh, our safety and design projects on existing roadways. Uh, to date, that's affected uh, bank service areas four, uh, six, and nine. Uh, and now has uh, the agency indicated uh, bank service area seven will be closed uh, that's the entire metropolitan area stretching on up to uh, St. Cloud with the exception of the southern portions of Dakota County. Um, it now encompasses, the slide has about 51 counties. We're now up to nearly 60 counties with the closing of bank service area 60. Uh, the effect of this um, policy change is basically to shut down uh, construction projects in the affected counties. Again, I want to emphasize we're, we're using counties as a terms of geography. It may be a township project that's shut down, it may be a city project, or it may be a county project. Uh, the, the time of the announcement of, this, uh, of the, this change in policy was too late for any local government to increase its property tax levies to offset the loss of the state dollars. So frankly, our only way to deal with it is to engage in a Rob Peter pay to pay Paul type strategy where we could delay one project that was previously scheduled to come up with the additional dollars to fund the other project. In terms of what it takes to uh, fix this, again, the agency's gone through it. It takes $10 million to recapitalize the wetlands banks. And in the interim, until credits are actually available, because of the lag between when the money comes and how long it takes to construct, revegetate, re and get those uh, new wetlands banks to the point where they're functioning. Uh, they also need $5 million to go out and purchase wetland credits on the open market. Uh, as you know, uh, the Gov Governor Dayton's uh, budget uh, includes both these items and the combination of um, House File 434 and 431 also contain, contain, contain this money. I uh, just want to emphasize this has been a legal obligation for the state for over 20 years. Uh, and one of the provisions in uh, House File 431 has amended by the DE2 uh, amendment says if you can't come up with the money to do this, uh, and there will be a time lag regardless of how soon we get the money, we need some regulatory relief as well. That regulatory relief is one, to reinstate the former policy of allowing trading of credits between the bank services areas, and secondly, to comport uh, the state policy with the federal policy that certain smaller areas are not subject to the wetlands, uh, wetlands replacement requirement. Uh, failure to act immediately, at least on this regulatory relief and the $5 million means, you know, it obviously affects us as local <coughs> road authorities and our citizens in that these projects will not be built. But more, as importantly, it affects our private contractors. We generally don't do this. We contract them to the private sector. Those jobs won't occur. Won't occur. Uh, the injection of dollars into our local economies won't occur, and the wages that would be paid to their employees won't be paid. Uh, I want to emphasize the planning for the construction season is happening right now. We're doing our final right-of-way acquisition, we're putting out bids and awarding the bids, and we're doing final permits. All that's on hold. If we don't have uh, an answer to this problem by late this month or early uh, in March, Basically, we're going to lose a construction season. Um, you know, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude. Um, again, want to thank uh, Representative Fabian and Representative Nornis for carrying these bills. I also want to thank the agency. Uh, they have worked with us on this issue. Uh, they gave us notice in October about this uh, and uh, have provided plenty of information to assist us in coming up with a solution to that, this problem. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sulem. 
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Kent Sewell, I'm General Counsel and Director of Governmental Relations of the Minnesota Association of Townships. And I am here to also support uh, this bill as amended. It is a critical piece of legislation and the timing is also very uh, important uh, so, so there's not a lost construction season. There's a little uh, side issue for townships on this and that is we have a provision in the contracting law that allows us that if we have a similar comparable project to a county, we can work with the contractor and use the county's contract, usually uh, allowing us to get much better pricing for the road projects. If the counties cannot move forward with uh, contracting this session, we will lose our ability to reach out and double uh, up with those same contractors, which will drive up the cost of our roads uh, work, regardless of whether wetlands are involved or not. Uh, so there's a lot of issues that are, you know, just that trickle down approach of how things are working. and. We just, we cannot wait, we cannot lose another season. Uh, as is, we're barely breaking even on doing road maintenance. There's gonna come a time where we have to start seriously upgrading these rural roads, making them wider, making them uh, capable of handling 10, 12 ton standards as the farm equipment gets bigger, as other trucks become bigger. And if we don't have the proper uh, procedures and funding in place for this mitigation, both now and into the future, uh, none of that is gonna be able to occur. So uh, with that, I'll ha be happy as I answer questions, but we, with this bill is, is definitely a top priority. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to, to clarify if, because these, these projects obviously have been in the works for a long time. Um, it's not like the projects themselves are emergencies. It's the point that we're at right now that seems to be the emergency. And so I'm wondering if, um, where would we be as far as this being an emergency, had we actually um, passed a bonding bill and had the bonding bill go through last year? Um, Either Mr. One. Chairman, um, Representative Becker Finn, um, the agency's probably a little bit more appropriate to answer that question, but I will take a cut at it. Last year's bonding bill had $5 million for this program. Um, it probably would have carried them for a short time, but um, again, because this underfunding has gone over a number of bienniums, they would have become short on their wetland bank capacity in the individual bank service area, and maybe this wouldn't have happened right now, but it would have happened soon regardless because they need more funding than that five million. As has been asked here, it's really 15 million to just address the needs over the next two years. Mr. Representative becker -Pin. Uh So just, just to clarify, kind of the larger problem here is really the, the underfunding over time, not necessarily the, this policy change that, that happened more recently. Um, Mr. Chairman, yep. Representative, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Wagenius. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to make sure I understand Welcome. this correctly. Um, what we really need is $15 million because the five is the patch to get us to the 10. It might, you're shaking your heads, yes. Okay. So what happens if we don't have a bonding bill this year since this is only the patch? Um, yes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Carlson. Representative Wagenius, um, right now we need the patch, right now. Again, if we don't have this by the end of March or, uh, early, by, excuse me, by the end of February, mid-March, um, we likely are gonna lose, lose some, if not all, of these construction projects. But eventually, and hopefully by the end of this session, the $10 million is needed because of exactly the timeline that the agency staff indicated. It takes several years from when they get the money to when they construct the new wetlands to when it's revegetated to when it's functioning. So recapitalizing their wetlands banks with this $10 million is a critical piece. I think it can wait uh, to later in the session, but from my perspective, it's important that it does occur by the conclusion of the session. Representative Wagenius. So now my understand, I mean, thank you. Okay. Now my understanding is if 
the bonding bill were not to pass, we would be here next year asking for a new patch. Mr. Sulem. Mr. Chair, uh, I think we not only would be looking for a new patch, but that patch would be more difficult to obtain because more credits will have been all purchased by this year's patch without being able to start the process of constructing the new uh, wetlands to create the new bank. And so now you're going to have a problem where we're going to run out of the ability to patch because there won't be the credits available uh, if we don't do bonding. So it's, it's you literally, you know, if you want to say you're kicking can, the can down the road, at some point we lose the point to kick because there's no, there's nothing left. So we've got to have the two-part system in order to fix now and then start replacing so we have something to draw from in the future years. Thank you. Representative Sundin, did you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, you know, we, we know what it's going to cost us to fix this for a year or two. And we know we're going to do that today. We're going to move this forward today. But is there a wholesale policy change that uh, we should be looking at so we're not back here with two years from now looking for more money? We don't know where the money's coming from. If we're going to kick Grandma out of a nursing home to pay for this? Or what, 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 what's the deal? Should we be looking at a wholesale uh, policy change? I'm going to ask both those testifiers yes or no. And if it's a yes, uh, what do you have for ideas? Mr. Sulem. Mr. Chair, Mr. Um, I'll just go first. Uh, we have had a long standing policy in our association of trying to uh, look at where can we reduce the two to one back to one to one, <laughs> still trying to achieve the <coughs> objectives, but without taking additional lands, particularly in the rural areas uh, where we're getting hit with the credits being acquired in our, land, our areas because they're cheaper and there's that um, there's the availability of the land to, to do it. Uh, but now that creates other problems. So we've been working with Representative Green uh, on his uh, legislation. Um, if there's other options available to help reduce costs, we are certainly open to us uh, negotiating and sitting at the table with strategizing on that because I think you're correct. There, we're we're going to have issues long term as well. Uh, right now, we need this to, to bridge us to get us to a long term policy change, but we'd be happy to have those conversations. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I guess I'll, I'll just add. Um, these types of programs that require long-term or permanent funding are addressed in other areas of the budget, uh, specifically the areas of education aids and uh, local government aids. Uh, those programs have what are called open and standing appropriations. Um, so there is no requirement uh, for those several programs that the legislature reappropriate the dollars for those every biennium. If you were to go to go to a system like that, uh, then we would have some more assurance that this will be funded every biennium, rather than having to come back here in every two years and uh, pin our hopes on the uh, recommendations and ultimate enactment of the bonding bill that simply has failed in meeting the funding obligation for this program for several bienniums now. Thank you. Representative Hansen. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, you know, I've got a, a working truck and I seem to pick up a lot of nails all the time. And uh, last time uh, I went to get them patched, uh, the, my, my maintenance guy said, you know, you've got a lot of patches on this tire. And eventually I had to, I had to buy some new tires. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're <clears throat> there is a traditional lack of backing up the commitment with funding. But it's been exacerbated by last year's failure of not having a bonding bill. Um, and so we're at this position, and I think the governor recognized that by asking for five and ten. So we have a little bit of, of uh, capacity here. So we're not back here next year if all we do is get the five million. And Mr. Chair, we, we talked on the floor, and I think at the last meeting, where does this five million come from? We don't we don't know. Representative Sandine talked about nursing homes. I suppose it could come from education anywhere if it's general fund. And so the general taxpayers having to do the patch every time um, is not a, a good way to do business. Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the issue of uh, lining up with the federal government on the impact of uh, less than 10,000 square feet. Could you describe uh, 
what you have in mind there in a little bit more detail. Mr. Carlson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Torkelson, um, basically has, again, the agency outline. We, we have to meet two requirements uh, when we uh, have construction projects that uh, impact wetlands. We have to meet the state requirements under WACA or possibly the public waters uh, permitting system, and we have to meet the federal requirements. Uh, the federal requirements are a little bit more generous than the state requirements. I should make it clear um, there are some exemptions under state law that would apply to these pro projects absent the local road wetland replacement program. And those exemptions depends on the area of the state and the type of wetlands that um, we are talking about, but they range from a high of 10,000 square feet down to a low, I be believe, of 1,000 square feet. Um, absent the local road wetland replacement program, we would in fact qualify for those. Um, and the federal government has some of what of a similar uh, program under what's called the regional general permit. Um, there's some disagreement between our engineers and the agency as to the extent of that, but at a minimum, it's 0.1 acres. Um, and so basically we're saying during the period that uh, the wetlands banks credits are not available in the individual bank service areas, uh, we would be exempt to the same extent that we are functionally exempt from the federal requirement until such time that uh, the wetlands banks are up and running in each service area <coughs> to meet the demand out there. Representative Torkelson. Just to make it clear then, so you're proposing a temporary uh, alignment with federal requirements. Mr. Chairman, uh, <coughs> Representative, that's correct. It only you. is in place until such time that all the bank service areas have wetlands banks up and functioning and providing for it. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> Representative Fisher? Yeah, I've, I've got a, a question or a little bit more of a concern. Um, I definitely see that we've got a, a serious need here that we have to address, but uh, the thing that keeps coming back to my mind is is where the money's coming from. I know that the governor's got a budget outlined and addresses those, whether it might be some increased fees. He's got things addressed in a sustainable way. The, the problem that we have is we don't know what is happening here, and that causes me a lot of angst. But my regular job is I'm a CFO in a small nonprofit, and when I first came in, they had not done things in a real sustainable way, and as a result, the organization almost didn't make it. Yeah, and this is some of the things I kind of feel here is not knowing what the overall plan is going to be. It causes, causes me concern. I don't feel that we're being very um, uh, responsible in knowing how this is going to impact our other budgets and trying to figure out where we're going to. I don't know if we're going to have, you know, are we going to have cut targets here, or is the money going to be appropriate and it's going to rob, it, rob another fund? I. I just have some serious concerns along those lines and was wondering if you can provide any guidance as to uh, where things are going to go. I'm just trying to think of it from a fiscally responsible way like we would do in business. That's a question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know, what we're doing here is uh, we're, we're, we're following the recommendations of the people who are on the ground doing this stuff and uh, we're trying to fast track this uh, bill today so that we can get it out of here and get it to the floor and, and wherever it needs to go next. I believe it's... Uh, uh, ways and means and um, you know I, me personally I'm committed to solving this problem long term and where that road takes us uh, during the session I don't know exactly where that is Representative Fisher but I do know and I recognize that this is a, a, a need a critical need and uh, I'd look forward to working with you on it okay so uh, the suggestion that you have uh, my door is always open and uh, most people have my cell phone number and everyone has my email address so uh, come on up and let's have a cup of coffee and talk about it. Representative Fisher. Uh, and, and I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, I, uh, that opportunity, but I also know it's going to have to be something that uh, going to have to come from, I know, from uh, people making decisions probably at a higher level than, than you're involved with. And, and I hope that we can have some advocacy so that we can make sure that we've got as good of a target as possible, make sure that we can address properly not just this issue, but the other issues that are coming before us. And to that point, Representative Fisher, I would say that uh, I think that my leadership is uh, always willing to listen to people. So make yourself available to them and express your concerns. Thank you. 
Uh, Clark jo uh, I'm sorry, Representative Johnson. Thank you. Uh, I know Clark. Thank you, too, Mr. Chair. I know Clark too well. <laughs> okay. My, you know, I have this similar concern, you know, and, and it, as I, I, I recognize the challenge we have with the, with the emergency, um, and we need to deal with it. I agree with you on that completely. But it would be nice to have some sort of context of, of the magnitude of this. So my, my question is, what was the target in the last biennium for this committee? So assuming this, you know, I, it, it feels like this would likely come out of this, this target. Um, if, if, if it did, what would be the, what was the size of the target last time so we can see the percentage or the magnitude of it? Well, yeah, I don't know what the target was off the top of my head. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that we can find that and, and we can talk about it at another time. Yes. Uh, perhaps Mr. Hagemeyer would know? He might. <laughs> Mr. Hagemeyer. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I don't remember the target number off the top of my head exactly. I can try looking in here. I probably just have the expenditure numbers, though, for the current years that we're in, 16 and 17. This, the bill has it as a fiscal year 17 appropriation, um, so the money would be available immediately after it's enacted. The, when we're doing our targets, current the current upcoming targets for the budget years would be fiscal years 18 and 19. So this could play into it. It might not. It would be up to the leadership who give whoever decides the targets, how that would affect the target. But I can take a look and see if I have the actual target number in here. It does change, though, because we have uh, more things in our jurisdiction this time with the Explore Minnesota Tourism. So we have to compensate for that as well. But I'll take a look and see if I have it. I, I just want to have it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want a general scope of it. What was expended in the last biennium from the general fund through, through legislation through this committee would be would give me that picture as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I don't have it right in here, I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay. uh, next, I'd like to have uh, uh, Mr. Myron come down from Washington County, uh, Mr. West from Ottertail County, and then uh, Don Arnosti will be on deck. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Hornstein. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I had a similar question to uh, Representative uh, Johnson, but. Really? Um, so just a comment, um, you know, we've talked about different areas of the uh, general fund where this may come from, but probably the first uh, place you may look, Mr. That Chair, is within our committee. And, and so I have concerns about, you know, different agencies and others that might, um, that might lose money as a result of this action. So I just wanted to say that I, I know I, I agree with you, Mr. Chair, about, about the urgency, and I, I obviously support the, the concept here. It's just the... Uh, you know, the funding and where we're going to, you know, do the patch, and uh, so that's why I, I <coughs> getting that bonding bill going with that bonding bill going would be the, the ultimate solution to this. But uh, if we're going to have to use the general fund, I, I, I worry about, you know, the different areas of our own budget that may that may suffer as a result. Thank you, gentlemen. Oops, uh, Representative Lewick. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, I've got one major worry here, and that we we really need to move on this, and we can predict and procrastinate and be concerned about uh, future costs. Uh, but let's just keep it simple, and, and I would hope we'd move along and, uh, and uh, not slow these things down. We've got some folks here. I think we've got some additional valuable information that needs to be provided uh, to us. Uh, we all worry about uh, uh, future spending and bonding bills and those types of things. But I think we really need to slow down here on uh, on uh, that kind of discussion and, and stay focused on the immediate problem. Thank you. Gentlemen, proceed. Please identify yourselves for the record and who you represent. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Morning. Uh, members of the committee, I'm Fran Mira, and Commissioner from Washington County. I'm here to testify in support of House File 431 and 434. Washington County has many challenges in meeting the transportation needs of its citizens. First, we have extraordinary budget challenges like many other governments, and to meet those challenges, our county is one of 66 counties that have enacted local option taxes for transportation. However, even with these additional funds, we face shortfalls in maintaining our transportation system. Second, my commissioner district is wet. Uh, we have a lot of lakes and wetlands within our area, and it's very, very difficult to do a road project without impacting wetlands. And so certainly wetland replacement is a significant cost and we're concerned with the policies that Bowser put into effect on December 2nd. 
Washington County is located in Wetland Bank Service Area 6, which along with Wetland uh, Bank Service Area 4 were the first areas of the state where Bowser will not meet the state's legal obligation to replace the wetlands impacted by our existing road design or safety construction projects. We have no other dollars to offset the loss of the state paid wetland credits. We set our levy long before Bowser gave notice of its policy change in November and we cannot legally raise that. We have construction projects in our capital investment program which will impact wetlands. We have to spend highway dollars on replacement costs limiting the projects we have planned. Uh, our our uh, capital improvement plan goes out five years. So, you know, as we set our plan and we budget for that plan uh, out for those years, um, certainly this is going to have uh, on-bearing uh, cost to the, to the county that we need to consider. And this means that dollars these projects would have injected into the local economy won't happen. Uh, we've, it'll mean no contracts for our private contractors, no wages for their employees. I can't tell you the entire effects of the loss of the state funded and administrated uh, local wetland replacement program. However, I do think it's worthy to mention that this is exactly the type of state local partnership that the state should be encouraging. Because the state on, uh, through Bowser develops multiple wetland banks across the state, they've developed an expertise to create quality wetlands. The regional approach allows for expanded wetlands of higher values and use. Further, they save local governments from the administrative burden of dealing with the federal wetland regulations administered by the Corps of Engineers. It's really streamlined a cumbersome process for us by relieving the affected local governments from having to get two or three separate programs. And certainly the wetland um, banking service areas that have been talked about are, are significant to us as well. I happen to live in uh, the Rice Creek Watershed District, which encompasses Ramsey, Washington, and Anoka County. Now, Anoka County is in a separate wetland banking district, and yet, um, as a taxpayer to the watershed, the watershed district was instrumental in creating wetland banking credits using uh, general fund revenue uh, taxes that I paid in uh, to create wetlands in a banking area that I don't have access to. So just an interesting situation that we're dealing with. There are credits out there that have been created uh, that we're not currently able to use. I'd last like to emphasize that as a representative of the state's counties that administers the state's health and human services and corrections program and is subject to numerous environmental regulations that we either have to comply with or administer on behalf of the staff, uh, state that we are very sensitive to unfunded mandates of which we have many. I believe you and I share similar values and believe a deal is a deal. Uh, when the state agreed to put in place the local wetland replacement program in 1996, it's been mentioned earlier, over 20 years, 21 years ago, and assume the wetland replacement costs for existing road construction projects, local governments agreed to continue to pay the tab for wetland replacement on our new roads and lane expansions that was mentioned earlier. We also gave up a half acre exemption from the Wetland Conservation Act for design and safety improvements to existing roads. We've held up our side of the bargain and now we respectfully uh, request that the state meet theirs. Thank you, Mr. Myron. Uh, Mr. West. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is uh, Rick West. I'm the Public Works Director and County Engineer for Autotail County. Um, and thank you for the opportunity this morning to testify. First, I'd like to take you back to pre-1996 when we as uh, counties were mitigating our wetland impacts via individual projects, meaning that we were uh, widening out existing wetlands as we were doing reconstruction projects in the interest of safety. This was a cumbersome process. It was not very efficient. And secondly, and, and probably of equal importance, at that time, those wetlands were not what I would term a quality uh, replacement uh, as we uh, are doing today. As we move forward over the past 20 years and we uh, look at where we've come since that time, um, I would say that the uh, local road wetland replacement program has been an efficient program and has certainly streamlined uh, from our perspective, the process of wetland mitigation on local uh, projects, whether it be county, 
City or Township. As we uh, are here today, Ottertail County has two projects uh, that are proposed for 2017, uh, both certainly reconstruction projects with wetland impacts. We have one in our northeastern corner of our county, which is uh, uh, along the west side of Pelican Lake. Uh, the value of that project is about uh, five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, um, we have a bid opening scheduled for February fifteenth. Uh, um, we we have a thirty day hold on the bids to consider. So, our with that project, our permits are in hand. All the, all of those have been acquired. Uh, however, the the wetland uh, impacts have not been mitigated. We are on bank service area four. So there's uh, there's none available. Our cost to uh, go out on the, on the market to purchase wetlands uh, will run us about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That we did not budget for 2017. Um, the second project, I, sh I should back up a second, uh, with the nine project, an option of not to proceed uh, is, is not available to us to consider. We have a lot of utility relocations to do, and those folks, uh, utility companies, have hired their, their contractors, there are materials on hand, so we are going to have to go into our budget uh, uh, and find out or how we can find two hundred fifty thousand mm dollars. -hmm. Our second project is just north of Fergus Falls. It's about four miles in length. Estimated value of about four million dollars. That one we will not proceed on for 2017 uh, due to uh, uh, the situation with the uh, wetland bank. The effects of this, um, th there's a large effect to our local contractors, our regional contractors. This is large volume of work, reference our, our transportation plan. Um, and it also, I think, affects, uh, I don't know what the right words here, our, good, our goodwill to our citizens that are expecting this work to be done, uh, particularly the uh, County 27 project. Been looking forward to it for a number of years, and uh, we will not be able to uh, make good on that uh, commitment in our, in our plan. <coughs> Our, uh, basically our drop dead date for the uh, 27 project would be about March 15th. If there isn't some temporary funding that comes into play or uh, uh, an option for Bowser to go back to the way we, they were operating where they were actually borrowing credits from a bank service area that had credit to an area that did not. <coughs> um, so for that second project, that March 15th is uh, uh, has been stated before is is kind of where we're at with with the drop dead on that second project. Um, in concluding, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, I want to thank uh, Representative Fabian and Representative Norris for authoring the uh, legislation in uh, House File uh, 431 and 434. And uh, at our county board meeting uh, Tuesday of this week, uh, our county board wanted to. Uh, convey to this committee, Mr. Chair, that the co our county board is full support of this legislation and that it is very important for Ottertail County. With that, I'll, I'll close and uh, thank you and stand for questions. Thank you both gentlemen, uh, not just for testifying, but for the good work that you do. Representative Sundin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just refresh my memory, uh, if you will, what county are you from? I'm uh, with Ottertail County. Ottertail County. Representative Sundin. Just uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just reaching into another band aid box here. Uh, we passed uh, legislation a couple years ago that uh, allowed counties to uh, have a half cent sales tax, I believe it was, half cent. Does Ottertail County participate in that? Mr. West. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, Ottertail County, as of the beginning of 2016, uh, put into place the half local option sales tax for transportation at a half a cent. We've also put in a $10 uh, wheelage uh, fee, which is also put into effect at the beginning of 2016. Given those two additional revenue sources, uh, with our long range transportation plan, which we spent three years developing, uh, given the additional funds that those two sources provide, uh, we are still on an annual basis uh, short uh, Seven point five million dollars. Representative Dean, I think that just uh, makes the point we're running out of band aids. Thank you, you. Uh, gentlemen. Mr. Thank Chair. you for. Whoops, I'm sorry, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner Myron. Good to see you again. Um, I think your 
testimony is good. Uh, this might be off a little bit. I'm not. I don't think Bowser's the bad guy here. I think they uh, they're doing what they can, and they had to make a policy with limited money. And it goes back to not having the money, and the money didn't come because we didn't get a bonding bill. So we're in the position of cleaning up the mess that happened, and it's a difficult situation. But it's not Bowser. I think is trying to manage with a rapidly decreasing pot of money because it was zero money that came in last year because the failure of, of uh, the bonding bill. Mr. Yes. Chair, Representative Mr. Hansen, Myron. I, I certainly understand that. We appreciate uh, Bowser's support of this. I think the point I was trying to make is that, um, you know, we as counties have unfunded mandates, significant unfunded mandates in the way of health and human services and other areas, and yet um, I think uh, there's an expectation that we still do our work and we still do our job, and uh, and that falls on the uh, to the burden of the, the taxpayers, the property taxpayers within the county, and uh, and obviously there's only so much we can lift with the property tax dollars that we collect within Washington County, and and uh, as I indicated, uh, uh, those levies were set prior to us even getting notice. So now I understand the uh, unfortunate situation that Bowser is in here. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you both. Appreciate your good thank work. Thank you for the Mr. Arnosti, please uh, come to the table. Oops, I'm sorry. I missed somebody. Becker Finn, I'm sorry. Gentlemen, uh, you may have a question here. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess m more of a comment. I, um, I I wanted to thank you for coming in. It, it's important for us to remember that it is the local communities that are having to deal with these um, emergencies that that we're creating and so I, I just wanted to kind of put it out there that what makes it an unfunded mandate is us failing to do our jobs and get these things funded and um, as much as we would like to keep it simple and just focus at on the you know each individual fire that we need to put out it would be it would be much better for us to be um, looking longer term so that we can um, prevent these kinds of situations from happening in the future. So, so thank you for um, your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, we appreciate your leadership on, on this issue. We, we understand what you're trying to do. We appreciate uh, your understanding of the urgency and look forward to working with you. You know we understand that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arnosti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Members of the committee, my name is Don Arnosti. I represent the Isaac Walton League here in the state and I think it's fair to say some of the comments I'm going to be offering are shared broadly with many many conservation organizations um, uh, so much to say so little time mr. chairman asked me to keep it short and I will um, I, I want to say this program has been one of those uh, stellar partnerships between state and local government for two decades it's uh, functioned well there's one responsibility of the legislature, that's to provide the funding to Bowser to take care of the obligation for wetland replacement. And we've heard from local road authorities, and I, I am sympathetic to their concerns that right now all the slack's been taken out of the system, and it's no fault of Bowser's that they've had to say we're out of credit, we don't have the funds. Um, I'm here to testify, I originally came to testify in favor of House File 431, which was a bill that uh, proposed to completely fix the problem. $5 million in cash right now, $10 million in bonding. And then uh, I really appreciate the uh, suggestion that Mr. Uh, Carlson had about perhaps an open and standing appropriation. When you have a part of government that's working, a partnership between state and local government has been proven for 20 years, maybe it makes sense to do that. Um, speaking again for my membership, and, and I know some of you see me frequently, but I'm trying to represent the people who are not here, members of my organization. It's all the people's money. It doesn't really matter which pot it comes out of, right? All the money is taxpayer dollars one way or another and I think the people of the state have proven over and over again that they value our natural resources we voted tax increases on ourselves in the face of a crashing economy that's a message that I hope to get through to the environment committee here please step up protect our wetlands um, this has been a program 
program that's been doing a good job of it. Um, we do oppose um, section one of the bill, which is a temporary rollback of policy to the minimal federal standards. 25 years ago, this state passed a state wetland conservation law because we are a watery state. We are a wetlands, lakes, and river state. We understand our economy, our lifestyle, everything depends on protecting that. And the Wetland Conservation Act is a state expression of raising the bar in places where we feel the federal law doesn't do the job. So the, it is the failure of government over multiple legislators to adequately fund this program that puts us in this position right now. And I hope that you can demonstrate that there's a will to govern. I, I know of no person who opposes, no organization who opposes funding this program. And so what I would ask you to do is fully fund it. Put the Band-Aid in place, the $5 million, and put the intermediate term fix, which is the $10 million bonding fix, and be bold and go ahead and do it and ask everybody to say this doesn't mean this has to be the massive bonding bill. This is one piece of, of government that works. Can we show that we can fund it? You could pass this next week. And we know the governor would sign it because he's put it in his budget. And uh, I'm not sure who you would be waiting uh, to negotiate with because in the Senate you've had a similar conversation. Um, Finally, um, a couple of discussions. People talk about de minimis and that oh, we're only talking about a tenth of an acre here, a tenth of an acre there. What I remind you is that those de minimis, those, uh, those wetland losses that will not be replaced are multiplied by tens and hundreds of projects, perhaps even thousands. I understand there's a pent up desire to do a lot of road replacement and repair and perhaps this legislature will get to funding that. So the, the uh, wetland losses are not the small numbers that you hear, but multiplied by a much larger figure. And finally, the last point I'd like to make is that every area of the state has a need for wetland protection and even strategic restoration, even uh, Representative Eklund's district. And by that, I would mean uh, local water plants often call for very specific uh, wetland protection or restoration often having to do with downstream flooding or water storage needs. And if we can be smart and work our replacements in a manner that benefit and clearly are identified by local water plans, I think everybody can be happy with the work that we're doing. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. We do urge that you uh, fully fund this program and move it very rapidly. Thank you. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe following up on uh, Mr. Arnasi's question, if we could have uh, someone from Bowser uh, clarify or at least talk about the difference on the bill uh, on lines 1.15 and 1.16, 1.17, and the lines on the DE2 of 1.13, 1.14, and 1.15, just to to drill down on that, Mr. Chair, uh, in response to Mr. Arnosti's uh, comments. Sure. Mr. Wyrens, or Commissioner Wyrens, excuse me, Director. I'll get it right. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Hansen, if you would please repeat your Representative Hansen question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Mr. Wyrens. If you look on the bill 434 on lines. 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, and then you look at the DE2 on 1.13, 1.14, 1.15. If you could explain that difference, I know that uh, there were uh, the agency and uh, the interests were meeting, and uh, so there was a modification in developing the DE2. If you could. Uh, say what that means, what that modification means from the bill uh, on, uh, on this question of de minimis, uh, 1.15, 1.16, 1 1.17 in the bill in contrast with the DE2 that's in, in front of us. Director. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, so I can, I'll start with the first part and maybe Director Wyrens can, can pitch in here and, and answer your question. Uh, part of the part of it was a technical adjustment 
because technically the Army Corps of Engineers does not provide exemption, they provide for mitigation. So if they issue a, a GP, a general permit, that general permit has to say whether or not mitigation is required. So there isn't this automatic exemption that happens. So that was a, a the 1.13 through 1.17, that's what the technical change is in the DE2. Uh, Mr. Wyrens, anything? No, I have nothing further to add, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Representative Hansen? We're good. Okay. Any further discussion to the bill? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I do have an amendment if that would be, now would be the time. That would be a good time. Um, I would move the A1 amendment um, to bring the funding for the bill into the governor's recommendation and to bring um, bonding in front of us as well. Uh, you know, Mr. Chair, the usual process is that bonding bills go through the committees and uh, this legislature has already, the House has passed a, a bonding bill already. Um, and, um, you know, this, this $10 million here is what the governor recommended uh, for long-term funding uh, so that you can build the banks that we can use in the future. Um, if we're going to be moving a bill forward, uh, at least we know that bonding, where bonding comes from. Um, and I think the concern of our committee is that, or our side of, the, of our committee, is that when we get into spending general fund dollars, that the record isn't very good. The record is that I think maybe last year the target was, or last biennium was a 33% cut target. Um, and to meet that, then there were dollars that were rated from funds or there were fees that were proposed or uh, there were general fund projects that were cut. So we're very concerned um, as we move forward here. Uh, I think we recognize the need for the money. Uh, we recognize the need for complete money. And so I'd move the A1 amendment and ask for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, m members, I, um, I would urge a, a no on the amendment. I recognize the urgency of all this. Um, I think that one of the overriding messages that I've heard today and in the past couple of weeks is getting this expedited as quickly as possible. And I understand what you're wanting to do here, Representative Hansen, but quite frankly, I think it would not be in the best interest of, of the bill that I proposed uh, to get that done quickly. Um, you know, another day here, another day there, another stop at another committee and drawn out debate on, on bonding and the need for it or the non-need depending upon different things. I just, um, I really want to focus on the issue that our testifiers have talked about and that's getting this uh, uh, construction season started now. And I think that we have plenty of time in the upcoming session uh, to address uh, the yet existing and, and I'll even call it critical need for the future. Thank you. Yep. Representative Hansen. And, and Mr. Chair, and I'd, I'd ask for a roll call on the amendment. And, no problem. Um, I think we recognize the need. I also think when we're spending $5 million here and $10 million there, um, it's worth discussion. And that discussion could have occurred if we'd had a special session. It could have occurred uh, last year when the bonding bill was dessert and saved until the end. And, but we didn't have it. We didn't have that discussion then. And we wouldn't be in this mess right now if we'd passed that bill. So um, we, need to, we need to get, we need to fund the needs and to meet the commitments to the, to the local governments. Thank you. And to that point, I would say we did pass that bill. Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You took the words out of my mouth. As everyone in here knows, we did pass that bonding bill off the House floor and uh, it was a good bill and supported by both sides of the aisle uh, messed up by action on the senate side of this uh, street and uh, of course failed in regular session we had multiple opportunities to resurrect that in special session but the governor's continued insistence on making it bigger and bigger uh, made it impossible for him to see the value of the bill as it stood and therefore nothing happened uh, but we did our work here in the House, and I would like to thank my colleagues on the other side of the aisle for voting for it. 
Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Clark. Just a quick question, Mr. Chairman. When, when you were referring to your bill, when you were referring to your bill, are you talking about the governor's bill that you're authoring, or are you talking about a different bill? I'm talking about my bill that was before us, the, before the. Oh, committee. this bill. Okay. Okay. All right. I wasn't sure because yep. I thought you were referring to a different proposal. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Uh, with that, the clerk, uh, uh, the chair votes uh, nay. All right, Vice Chair Heinzman. Nay. Representative Hansen. Yes. Representative Backer. No. no. Representative Becker Finn. Yes. Representative Bliss. No. Representative Karen Clark. Yes. Representative Tony Cornish. No. Representative Rod, Rob Eklund. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Green. No. Representative Hoppy. No. Representative Hornstein. Yes. Representative Brian Johnson. No. Representative Clark Johnson. Yes. Representative Lehman. No. Representative Lewick. No. Representative uh, Metza is absent. Uh, Representative Newberger. No. Representative Sundin. Yes. Representative Swazinski. No. Representative Torkelson. No. Representative Uglum. No. Representative Waginius. Yes. Uh, there being 14 nays and 9 ayes, uh, the amendment is not adopted. <coughs> to the bill, members. Um, with that, Representative Hornstein. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, You're welcome. I'm disappointed this didn't go on, but I'm going to vote for the bill. And um, I just want to make a general observation. I, I was pleased uh, comments on both sides of the aisle. Uh, this is a, you know, this is an area where environment and transportation kind of over overlap a little bit intersect intersect as it is as it were and um, uh, and I appreciated the urgency uh, that we feel about uh, getting these projects done uh, you know before the construction season in 2017 and I hope you'll join representative Torkelson and I as we try to put together and, and make this the year that we have a, a, a good overall comprehensive transportation bill because the same principle applies which is these these infrastructure projects don't go away they just get more expensive and so you know the longer we put these bigger projects off uh, the more expensive it'll get so I'm voting for this in that uh, in that spirit and uh, and I hope we can uh, come together well, Representative Hornstein I love your good spirit thank you mm -hmm. so with that I would like to renew my motion to re-refer house file 434 as amended uh, to ways and means all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. those opposed the bill is on to Ways and Means. Thank you, members. All right. Let the fun begin. DNR budget. Commissioner. <laughs> Ms. Ulick, it's good to see you again, too. Thank you for being here. Commissioner Landwehr, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. For You're welcome. Recommend. Tom Landwehr, Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources. Always glad to provide some fun for uh, your committee, Mr. Chairman. And uh, is that not on? Is that? It's uh, just ahead. a little noisy in here right now. Can you just wait just a second, please, Commissioner? I can't believe everybody doesn't want to stick around to hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I came. <laughs> I think they're. I think they're reloading, Mr. Chairman. All right, proceed. <laughs> Mr. Land. Chairman, members. Please identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chairman, members, Tom Landwehr, Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, and with me today is our Chief Financial Officer, uh, Ms. Barb Julik. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, I'm going to provide some opening comments on our budget proposal and then turn it over to uh, Ms. Julik to provide the details. Uh, as soon as we get a uh, presentation up here, uh, you'll have something to look at. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members, I can uh, I can begin while we're uh, dealing with the uh, the uh, computer here. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, members, as I uh, we, presented. Uh, Commissioner, we do have a PowerPoint that we can work off of. Too. Okay, very good. And, I'll, and with I'll that, I'd like to interrupt you just real quickly. You, you told me when I visited you on Lake of the Woods when you were ice fishing that day and we took a picture of a couple of walleyes together, it was going to be your opening slide on your presentation, and I don't see that here. <laughs> Mr. Chair, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's on my smartphone. I could pass that around if you would. Uh, Thank you. Where did you get the walleyes? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I, I <laughs> would observe that many of us will be heading up to uh, Grand Rapids for I'm the sorry, Mini USA. I'm took us down a walleye hole there. So. <laughs> Four <is. laughs> Mr. Okay. Chairman, members, yep. um, so uh, just to open up, and uh, slide number two is one I'm looking at on your uh, handout there. The uh, mission of the Department of Natural Resources is threefold. We obviously conserve natural resources and think of uh, plants and animals and uh, uh, vegetative communities. We also provide uh, outdoor uh, recreational opportunities and uh, those who take part in hunting and fishing or snowmobiling or staying at state parks uh, understand uh, that component of our mission. And uh, thirdly, we uh, provide raw materials that are the foundation for much economic activity in Minnesota, especially with respect to what we call the uh, three T's, timber tourism, taconite. But specifically, we provide 30% of the uh, forest uh, raw materials that are used uh, by the forest products industry. Uh, we obviously uh, uh, regulate and permit a substantial amount of mining in the state, both iron mining and potentially non-ferrous mining. And we uh, work with uh, water appropriation. So uh, much of the business community needs water. We regulate the appropriations of that water. We monitor how groundwater uh, supplies are faring, and we uh, uh, issue appropriations on, uh, on groundwater. And tourism, uh, as I mentioned, obviously is driven by uh, hunting, fishing, uh, camping, uh, water recreation, and uh, all of those uh, economic uh, opportunities are things that we provide. Mr. Chair, uh, I'm going to decide to uh, uh, move to slide number three, if I could. Um, related to the uh, uh, proposal before you, the proposal reflects that in order to uh, manage uh, these resources in this mission, this mission uh, we in turn need uh, resources, uh, again, to uh, manage those uh, resources such as fish and wildlife, uh, state forests, state parks, waters, minerals, lands. Uh, and in particular, to look at the uh, products that we provide by those uh, uh, management dollars, uh, really extraordinary uh, hunting and fishing opportunities in this state, not just in terms of the diversity of species that we can provide, but the uh, populations, uh, abundant populations, and in addition, the great uh, public access that we have uh, through those uh, state public lands and uh, uh, state forests and so on. Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, State park and trail system draws a million users a year. We, we have uh, really a top-notch uh, state parks and trail system in the state. We have uh, outstanding uh, boating opportunities. The department manages over 1,500 public water accesses. We have 800,000 uh, registered boats in the state. Uh, extraordinary opportunities for ATV and uh, snowmobile users. We have about a quarter million of both. And as we know, uh, with respect to the Min USA event this weekend, uh, it draws uh, people from the cities and from all over the state into these uh, uh, rural uh, towns and communities to uh, take advantage of the 21,000 miles of snowmobile trail that we have uh, in this state. In addition, we uh, uh, really strive to maintain a healthy forest uh, uh, that can be productive both from the standpoint of uh, wildlife and fish and recreational opportunities, but for the, uh, providing raw materials to the uh, timber products industry, as well as helping uh, maintain a clean water, uh, surface water system, uh, the uh, uh, result of which provides uh, drinking water to the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul and a uh, strong minerals management program. The uh, uh, range is enjoying a bit of a recovery in the iron uh, mining sector, and uh, we're working with those uh, uh, companies to uh, ensure that uh, the uh, state can assist uh, whenever possible to sustain those operations. Finally, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, I'd, I'd observe that the, uh, the uh, department's budget is about 83% fee driven. So it is your boating fees, it's your hunting fees, it's your uh, park pass. And 17% uh, uh, is general fund. The 83% coming from fees is largely supported, uh, largely created and supported by the users. And we always uh, solicit their support before we come to you with any request because we know their support is essential. I think traditionally the users uh, uh, do support those fee increases because they directly see the benefits that those provide and the statutory uh, uh, outcomes that uh, 
the department manages. I, I mentioned just briefly because bonding has come up that uh, part of our uh, job is to manage $2.8 billion worth of uh, built assets, that's roads, bridges, uh, water control structures, uh, uh, buildings, and uh, a number of other things that uh, the department manages. Uh, slide number four, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, so this budget proposal that uh, you have before you will help us continue just to deliver the service that we, services that we have uh, traditionally provided the last few years. There is not a large increase uh, in services proposed here. But part of the reason we uh, have a uh, budget increase is because we face many of the same challenges that other departments do, but challenges that uh, many other departments don't face. Uh, some that uh, many face is that we have, uh, uh, of course, erosion of uh, revenues by virtue of uh, cost of inflation, but we also have increased program responsibility. So there are more aquatic invasive species, there are more uh, trail miles that we have to manage and so on. Uh, the uh, fees, as I mentioned, uh, uh, benefit or provide revenue for a large part of the department's activities. Uh, those have to be statutorily raised, so we have to come before you periodically to seek increases in those fees, and that's uh, n never an easy lift. Uh, the timing of our uh, request for fees is awkward in that we can't solicit support from the user groups until after the governor's budget has already come out. So uh, oftentimes those fee proposals catch our user groups by surprise, and then we have to go and promote those. So it's a uh, full-time job for many of our staff right now to inform the user groups why we have these fee increase proposals and what they're going to get uh, from that. But uh, th that fee revenue is also uh, impacted by th things that are beyond our control, such as uh, uh, weather impacts. When we have a cold, wet summer like we did, uh, I think 2007, our fishing license sales dip dramatically. When we don't have a lot of snow, our uh, snowmobile registrations dip dramatic dramatically. So we have some of these issues as well that are beyond our control. Uh, the uh, large benefit to having uh, fees, it diversifies our revenue uh, <coughs> sources, but at the same time, these are all statutorily dedicated. So they come from a specific source, they can be used for specific activities. If we have a balance in one fund but a deficit in others, we can't use those fees to uh, uh, deal with those, uh, those shortfalls. Um, and in some cases, we uh, just are lacking a stable funding source. Uh, the last few years, we've gotten one-time funding, for instance, for our Division of Parks. Uh, that is very challenging to manage across uh, multiple years, and uh, uh, it doesn't uh, really allow us to uh, maintain the services that we uh, hope to provide to uh, citizens. We have a very complex budget. We saw a little bit of that. You'll see more of that uh, going forward. We have over 50 funds in the department, and uh, much of that is dedicated, as I mentioned. There's a little flexibility with that. Majority of our budget is for boots on the ground. It's uh, staff. We have about 2,700 uh, full-time equivalent employees. That's about 4,000 uh, actual people, team members. And uh, whenever we have a budget deficit, when we anticipate a budget deficit, we have to re reduce our uh, service to Minnesotans by uh, reducing our, our staffing. And finally, Mr. Chair, I'd mentioned that uh, we have some unpredictable costs. When we uh, run into litigation that's not anticipated, uh, the costs of that litigation come out of the program that is uh, uh, the subject of that litigation, and that is not something we typically budget for. I will uh, note that the legislature has provided specific funding the last uh, couple of years to the department for some water-related litigation, and we uh, very much appreciate that and uh, hope that your support for that will continue. Mr. Chair, uh, page five really summarizes uh, the situation we're, we're in. Uh, our uh, funds operate much like a bank account, and so our water recreation account uh, has uh, dollars that come into it from our voter registration fees. And sometimes those fees are uh, in excess of our expenses, so we build a balance in those funds. And so there, there is a period of time after we increase those fees uh, that we uh, can spend m more money than we're making uh, or spend less than we're making, but recognizing that at some point in the future, uh, inflation is going to catch up with the program costs and the fund will go negative. You can see in the water recreation count uh, that uh, fund goes negative in about FY18. You can see all of these other accounts. Snowmobile account is essentially uh, uh, going in the negative right now. Game and Fish, uh, FY19. Uh, ATV, FY19. Cross Country Ski, 21. Invasive Species, FY18. Um, that means that the program is uh, spending more than is currently coming in. Obviously, we can cut the program, and that's uh, one of the things we'll talk about in a moment, but we're trying to maintain those services that we're providing people. Before we go into the red, we start cutting the program, so if we see that we've got a FY19 
uh, situation where we're going uh, uh, to zero, uh, we'll start uh, cutting expenses in FY18. And Mr. Chair, to, the, to my point, uh, we have uh, and we continually look for uh, cost efficiencies, ways of doing business differently, collaborating with others to reduce expenses. Uh, and, and here's three examples of how we uh, do that. We consolidate, we close offices and operations that are uh, no longer necessary or can be done uh, otherwise. Uh, for example, uh, we uh, in forestry, we've closed a number of our area forestry offices, combined those offices. Uh, we just closed the French River uh, fish hatchery up on the North Shore. Uh, uh, we will pick up some of the uh, uh, fish uh, raising operations at another hatchery. This particular hatchery uh, just was not efficient. 10% of the entire uh, energy budget for the department was used, was used at one hatchery. Uh, no longer made sense to operate that hatchery and we're closing it. We have uh, reduced and adju adjusted certain positions, for example, in our uh, parks and trails division. Uh, we have 60, uh, f uh, 66 state parks across the state. Uh, over the years, we have consolidated the management so we now will have one manager that's overseeing two or three parks and having assistant managers, managers at those parks in order to reduce the uh, number of uh, staff members uh, involved with that. And uh, we've created some efficiencies, especially in vehicle use uh, by, by changing our fleet uh, inventory. We have reduced our uh, uh, fuel use by 200,000 gallons per year uh, in one, uh, just, just in uh, fleet. And uh, for instance, in our park system, we have gone to 100% reservable. All campsites are reservable now, so we reduce the need for people at contact stations when people first drive in uh, to a state park. Uh, that's also had the unanticipated uh, benefit of uh, increasing the, the uh, use of our park so we get uh, more users because now people know that they can reserve a spot in advance. They know a campsite will be there when they get there. Uh, Mr. Chair, moving on to slide seven. But even with these uh, efficiencies, even uh, with these collaborations, we still find that uh, we are uh, going uh, uh, below uh, the fund balance in some cases, so we're already anticipating some expenses that we have to uh, uh, reduce. Uh, and for instance, uh, motorized trail maintenance, grant and aid for trail uh, maintenance is being reduced. And this uh, uh, snowmobile uh, account is a good example. Uh, in anticipation of that account going negative, we've reduced the amount of grants that go out. Uh, for those that don't know, 21,000 miles of snowmobile trails in the state are managed largely by local clubs. They receive grants from the Department of Natural Resources uh, to buy equipment, to pay for fuel, to uh, uh, do that uh, trail maintenance. Uh, they provide volunteer assistance. It's a phenomenal uh, uh, program in place. But uh, because of declining revenues, we're unable to uh, provide them the uh, level of funding that they, uh, uh, that they need. Uh, we've eliminated some aquatic invasive species grants as that uh, 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 surcharge uh, program has been uh, is, uh, uh, dealing with inflation uh, and reduced some of the prevention activities, some of the uh, 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 check stations at uh, uh, boat ramps. And finally, uh, uh, we've kept a number of vacation, uh, vac uh, excuse me, number of positions vacant as funds have uh, been short. And in particular, our uh, division of enforcement, we have about 185 uniformed officers out on the ground, but we're about 20 positions short right now because of uh, budget shortfalls in that division. Uh, that represents an area about the size of Massachusetts and Rhode Island combined that is currently without uh, an enforcement officer. And Mr. Chair, yeah. members, just Mr. obviously uh, absent the uh, funding requests, we uh, not only continue these uh, uh, vacancies and these uh, uh, service uh, failures, but we uh, will be look, having to look at additional uh, options as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, my last slide is the next one, number eight. Uh, um, with your assistance, uh, what we hope to provide with the uh, budget before you is to continue to maintain, you know, just a really top-notch uh, park and trail system um, for today and going into the future. Uh, in 2016, we had one million park visitors. Each one of those visitors spends an estimated $24 outside the park, so it's a great economic driver. Uh, we think we have a really world-class fishing and hunting experiences. Uh, we want to uh, use those experiences to recruit new people coming into uh, the sports of hunting and fishing. It's, hunting is a $700 million uh, uh, driver, economic driver in Minnesota. Fishing is a $2.4 billion uh, driver uh, in Minnesota. Um, you may have seen the news release that Bassmasters, a national group uh, uh, that uh, each year picks the, one of the best spots in, in the United States to 
host a fishing contest last, last year. They picked Mille Lacs Lake, uh, one of the best uh, smallmouth fisheries in the world. They have said they're going to do it again this year in Minnesota on Mille Lacs Lake because the fishing is so good. So in spite of some of the negative things about uh, the fish population in Mille Lacs, it is still a world-class fishery. Uh, we maintain the, the, uh, we will continue to maintain healthy, diverse forests. About 30% of the timber that's uh, used in the state for forest products comes from state land. But in addition to the uh, timber that uh, is provided, uh, those are areas where we hunt, where we fish, where we generate clean water, and uh, we provide habitat for a whole range of species that represent the biological diversity of Minnesota. Uh, the, just from the state lands, about uh, $8 billion of economic activity is generated, and that returns $150 million in uh, state and local taxes, according to the uh, forest products industry. And finally, we, continue, we will continue to conserve the state's resources. Minnesotans uh, are very passionate about our resources and our, out, and our outdoor recreation opportunities. Uh, the, the team of uh, staff at DNR is equally passionate about that. And uh, Mr. Chair, members, we look forward to working with you on uh, our budget uh, to continue to provide those services. Mr. Chair, members, uh, I'm happy to take questions right now, but uh, then I will turn it over <coughs> to Ms. Julek. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> there are a couple of uh, people on the list here. Uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, uh, and Commissioner. Uh, great, great overview. One of the things uh, on back on slide five, and, and this may be a, a question your some of your able staff folks may may need to dig into. But uh, that prediction uh, on where these various uh, accounts are going to run to zero or negative balance. Uh, particularly the ones for all-terrain vehicles, snowmobile account, water recreation account. Does this slide take into consideration the potential to lose the off-road gas tax uh, funds that flow into that on an annual basis? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, members, no, this, this predicts going forward with essentially the same set of parameters that we've got today. So the same gas tax that's out there presumes the same level of registration going forward, presumes the same level of expenses going forward. Representative Hansen. Oh, I'm sorry, follow up, Representative Lewis. No, okay, thank you. Yep, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Commissioner, you, you talked about the value of bringing people in and increasing outdoor uh, recreation and using that for tourism. And I just noted uh, that there's some large outdoor retailer uh, uh, show that goes on in Utah. It's like the largest in the country. And, and uh, Patagonia withdrew from that show as well as other retailers because of the state of Utah's anti-public land sentiment. And so I would encourage you and uh, the governor to put in a call to that show or, or to Patagonia or to the other retailers if we could attract something like that because of our uh, strong support for outdoor recreation. I think it would be uh, neat to, to uh, bring that economic activity here. Mr. Chair, members, I, I saw the same article. The Outdoor Retailers Association is uh, seriously considering looking for another venue. It's a huge uh, event that's been put on in Utah for years, and I, I had the same thought. I've not established a contact yet. I just saw the article yesterday, but I thought, what better place to demonstrate outdoor recreation than Minnesota any time of the year, even in the dead of winter? So uh, point taken, and we'll follow up on that. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Representative Clark Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to pick up on your comment, too. It's about the value of this, uh, of the resources that we, and the, the attraction to the state. And I'm thinking we have a workforce shortage in Minnesota. And so this fits with attracting people to move to Minnesota to fill the workforce needs. And so it's an extended value in that way. I just want to make the comment. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could just uh, add a short comment to that. Absolutely. And when you look at what the city of Duluth is doing, they're clearly aiming towards the, sort of the millennials providing that uh, outdoor recreation opportunity. I think, frankly, that's why a lot of Minnesotans continue to live here, even though, you know, it gets cold and wet. And, uh, and as I've traveled to other communities, such as War Road, International Falls, and so on, where they have expressed a challenge getting um, uh, workforce uh, recruitment, uh, encourage them to point out the opportunities we've got here because that is very, very attractive to especially the millennials and the, and the workers of the future. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, just, well, just one thing real quickly, uh, Commissioner, um, on the all-terrain vehicle account, uh, the numbers are going down, and we've talked about this before. Uh, in my area, obviously, ATVs are important, and DNR is closing some trail segments. Uh, it just, it's so counterintuitive to what we're doing here. We need to address that. But to that point, okay. Members, uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, save your uh, budget uh, uh, 
PowerPoint uh, presentations. So keep that in your save folder in your file. Also, the uh, governor's uh, uh, recommendations, that folder. Commissioner and Ms. Ulick, um, Tuesday, we're on the schedule again. So I look forward to seeing you then. Commissioner, I hope to see you in Grand Rapids uh, at the snowmobile uh, event and many other members there as well. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.